Welcome to the Veterinary Project Podcast, episode 088. Welcome to the show created by vets featuring absolutely no pets. This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, hosted by Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Our resident veterinarians have swapped out their stethoscopes in favor of microphones to bring you the Veterinary Project Podcast, a show focused on real conversations aimed to connect this amazing profession full of remarkable people. Through the sharing of collective stories and wisdom and connecting over the many unique challenges we face, we invite you to join our community of veterinary professionals leading intentional lives. And now, here are the hosts of the Veterinary Project Podcast, Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Dr. Natasha and Dr. Kat, thank you very much for joining us this morning. This is a podcast that actually in the big scheme of things has come together very quickly and yet uh, is likely one of the ones that I'm most excited about because of the topic and conversation we're going to get into today. Um Dr. Mm -hmm. Natasha, you and I worked together on ABVMA Council. We've got to know each other over the last two years. Uh, and then Dr. Kat, we've just got to know each other over the last couple of months in conversation and yeah. setup. And there is so much material that we need to dive into. And let's get started with that. It is not often that Mike and I get to have two strong, independent women on our podcast at once. And I am very interested to have all of us as listeners, learners, discuss what it looks like to be in veterinary practice. And I think that's a great place to start as a setup for our conversation is starting with you, Dr. Kat, can you give us a little bit of background to where you are in your career and what's got you here to this point? Uh, sure. So I started off uh, first thing fresh out of school in rural mixed practice in Rocky Mountain House, Alberta, which is pretty remote um, and kind of got my baby vet feet wet out there. So um, that continued into a love of mixed practice and continued mixed practice in Innisfil covering um, kind of a leave and then back into Pinoka. I've now changed my career once again and I've gone into Lokming so I can be my own boss for a little bit and see how other practices run, get a taste of how everybody runs things a little differently and what I like and what I don't like and explode on from there I guess fantastic and for yourself Natasha sure I'm currently a feedlot consultant for feedlot health management services by Talis Egg um, but similar to Kat's story there's lots of parallels um, I was not afraid of change so I think this is actually my my fourth job I started doing dairy medicine in New Zealand um, then did cow calf we bought mixed in provost alberta and then did locum work in the united kingdom prior to starting this position now excellent and if i am correct well you are same year grads at wcvm western college of veterinary medicine mm -hmm. and it was only a recent reconnection to then see the parallels within your careers and how they've come forward yeah. tell us a little bit more about that oh. Yeah, so um, <laughs> thank you for this opportunity to reconnect yeah. and reminisce with each other. Um, Kat and I, correct me if I'm wrong, we first met in Animal Science 200 at the University no, of did. Alberta. <laughs> yeah, so in our undergrad, and then we both got in after two years of study and then became um, really good friends in vet school. And actually, I didn't have a car in vet school, so Kat was my um, chauffeur <laughs> many times yeah. from Saskatchewan all the way back to Alberta which I'm still indebted to you. So thank you for all those <laughs> free trips. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. And then pass, diverge, and then come back together. And that is part of our first conversation in our recording notes is looking at what veterinary clinics are doing to embrace new grads and especially women in veterinary practice and mixed animal practice in particular. Walk us down that path because there is a lot of parallels, even though you hadn't connected when we went on to pre-recording notes, it was, oh, I've experienced that. Wow. I've dealt with that. And one of the amazing things of being able to come on a podcast now is to recognize that the two of you didn't know that about each other, even though you've spent hours and hours and hours in the same vehicle, in the same class, same parallels. Let's go down deep in there. 
So I think what originally happened was um, I had just reached out um, saying that, you know, I was going through a little bit of a difficult time. I felt that it was um, pretty, pretty based on the fact that I'm a woman in mixed practice and I was feeling isolated and I was feeling um, very alone. And I was thinking like, oh my God, like, am I the only one? Is there other people out there feeling this kind of, um, I guess, being lesser or being kind of prejudiced by the fact that I'm a woman and ended up having um, a really good phone conversation with Natasha and realized I'm not alone. Like, there's many people in my grad class who are in practice right now who feel the exact same way or have experienced similar things. Wow. Yeah, it was, um, it was cathartic when Kat reached out because I realized so many of my experiences that I had been keeping kind of my cards close to my chest, not, not sharing it with others because I felt maybe a, a sense of embarrassment or maybe it was, um, you know, I was guilty, it was my fault. And then listening to Kat explain her stories, I'm like, hold up, I've experienced identical situations. And once you start talking about it, it's like, oh, lots of us have, but for some reason we just haven't had the dialogue and it, it's very isolating. Yeah. Not talking I, about it. You feel like saying something or discussing it, well, it's a small community. Like what kind of repercussions are going to come from talking about this kind of, kind of thing? And yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, before we get too deep, maybe into the specifics, I think Kat and I will both agree though, we graduated vet school wanting to pursue large mixed animal practice. And we still have that passion and mm -hmm. um, we love it. Like we would not yeah. change our career paths. Um, yeah, we've been accepted. No. Um, yeah. We've been mentored by clients and employers, mm -hmm. but there's just a few details that um, are pretty important. I think that we need to talk about it, but by all means, it's not a knock against large no. mixed animal practice. We still love it and are so passionate about it, but hopefully maybe we can um, make it easier for others going through something similar. I think one of my difficulties actually changing jobs this time was I love mixed practice so much and I'm so passionate about, you know, food animal health, food safety, and um, just educating people about agriculture. And this is coming as someone who grew up in the suburban area of Short Park. Um, but I, I am very passionate about it. And I felt like you know, I reached a point where maybe I couldn't grow past any further in my career and I couldn't accept that and, and be happy. Yeah. And I remember our first conversation, Kat, and this stuck out to me is, and you and I didn't know each other. And you said, mm -hmm. I don't know if I have a future in mixed animal practice. Mm -hmm. And that hurt as a employer in mixed animal practice that wants only more strong, independent women to be able to see and find a place in mixed animal world. So there was a few adjectives that you brought up, Kat, in that initial discussion, feeling isolated, alone, prejudiced, sense of embarrassment. Mm -hmm. Do you mind going into those a little bit further for us? Why those are the words that come as first up to mind for this conversation? So I think in general, like mixed practice, and it's what you make of it, but it can be very isolating because you are usually um, in a rural location. You maybe have moved away from your friends. You maybe don't have a lot of associates that are there um, for you. And I think if you are going through something, um, especially when you feel like it's prejudiced against you because you're a woman, you, you have you don't feel like you have anyone to go to. And in my case, I was very lucky to have continued mentor support external to all my jobs, which made a huge difference. Um, I think um, that's, that's where you, you end up kind of just coning in, like, obviously this is happening because of something wrong with me. And that makes you feel even more isolated especially when you're pushing and trying and working as hard as you can and you're like, Oh, I'll just never be good enough. So you internalize it. Yeah. So something's wrong with me as an individual. Yeah. And then, um, I've forgotten what the second point was there. That's all uh, right. No, it was yeah. related to, to some of the adjectives you used in that initial, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. discussion, which I think then sets up for 
that conversation. Natasha, similar feelings, different. I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, I'm, I'm very similar. And, you know, hindsight's 2020. And I'm sure we're all aware, or if we're not aware, we can get on Google and type in gender discrimination in veterinary medicine and large animal specific medicine. And the stats state that it's there. Um, but then when you're, um, you know, maybe at conferences or with coworkers, no one, no one talks about it. So then if it does happen to you, you're, I don't know, Kat, I'm not going to speak for you, but my reaction was like, oh, like, what did I do wrong? What, what, yeah. what's wrong with me? Right. And you just mm -hmm. reflect internally. And it was actually, um, a dear, dear friend that witnessed it. And she just said this powerful statement that's just really helped me through everything. She just said, it's not your fault. It, it has nothing to do with you. Right. And they're like, oh yeah. And <laughs> that's the definition of gender discrimination, right? No matter what you do, it's your gender that you, um, that they're selecting against. So yeah, just, um, going through that process was, uh, very enlightening for me. And I can imagine how, Yes, like you said, enlightening, but also that weight off the shoulders yeah. potential that it would allow for. Uh, I would, and, and again, I'm jumping in here and maybe I'm jumping too deep, but I'd love to know some specifics. And I want to know specifics, not to dig into your individual stories to a place that's uncomfortable or in the wrong direction, but mm -hmm. to allow our listeners to understand a little bit better what that, what that looks like. Yeah. What's some of those specifics that you now recognize that, for all of us are not where they should be. One of the things that really struck me initially was a lot of this is not rooted in the clients because you can work hard enough to impress almost any client. It's the little things like a client mentioning, oh yeah, um, you know, your boss said you're not going to be doing preg checking because you're, you just can't, you're not strong enough. Or it's, you know, finding out in an underhanded way, the new grad who is male is making your salary and you're five, six, seven years out. And you're like, excuse me, that's, um, and you find out in some underhanded, strange way. It's having, you know, it's asking for, you know, moving forward or saying, here's what I need to stay with this practice. I'm really committed. I want to be a bigger part of this practice. I want to go into management. And having them say, hold up, have you thought about having a family yet? What are your thoughts about getting pregnant? When, like, getting pregnant might be a real difficulty for you entering management. And, you know, that's crushing. It's crushing. You're like, what does that have to do with anything? Like, those are things I can't change. I, I can't change that no. I'm a woman and have to, if I want kids, that's, you know, up to me to carry the child. Like, and what does that have to do with me as a vet? It has nothing to do with me and my ability to be a veterinarian. So. Yeah, very similar to Kat's story. Um, I was um, curious and I was advised by my financial planner to explore being a contract worker rather than an employee. And um, when I, I, I went to ownership, I was told that no, I, I cannot be contractor even though there was male contractors working in that business because I may get pregnant and then I'll want maternity benefits. So I was denied, which it's none of their business. Um, but at the time, like I had no plans. Um, and it's just, yeah, I mean, there's laws against that, but. There is. And <laughs> this is where I hesitate. To, um, and that's why this conversation needs to happen. Mm -hmm. because I almost can't see anything because I can't understand. And I can't both as both a male and an employer. And I'm saying both of those, how that is possible. And if there's two strong independent women in front of me right now, how many others are going yes. through this? Well, and that's, that's kind of what started off. You know, I connected with Natasha. I started connecting with other classmates who have left mixed practice. And I'm like, you know, here's what happened to me. I'm reaching out anything similar and it's staggering. There's a staggering amount of stories where the lack of support for them and the lack of, you know, acknowledgement, um, just ended their mixed animal career. It's, it's not, 
And I feel like a lot of finger pointing is done at maternity leave and pregnancy. Mm. And that's, to me, you got to make the job good enough that someone wants to come back. Like maybe it's not a problem of the maternity leave. It's a problem that the job is not something you decided you wanted to come back to. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and I, I take um, serious offense when I hear those comments, because when I, I think of so many of my female mentors that are mothers, some of those mm -hmm. are just exceptional vets, top notch, yeah. contributing to the business. And yeah. yeah. And they often bought their practice well, you know, well establishing a young family. And that never stood in their way. They still managed to, you know, multitask and be a mother and a good veterinarian and a business owner. Maybe their practice changed a bit or shifted a bit. So they took more of a managerial position, but it never stopped them from being in the vet industry if they truly loved the vet industry. That's it. And mm -hmm. our goal and hope is that everybody that's coming out of school wants to do that and gain to that. From that adage, yeah. then support in 2015, 14, excuse me, my notes aren't right in front of me. 2014. 2014. Yeah. 2014. yeah. To 2022 mm -hmm. in terms of support as both new grads compared to what you're seeing eight years later. Is there a change? Positive, negative, the same? I, I think new grads on a whole have a little bit more um, business know-how and have maybe a little bit more um, expectations than perhaps we did. Um, but I also think that's kind of a changing of the times. Like these grads also know a lot more because medicine is advancing than maybe we did. I mean, I learn a lot from new grads every time I'm around them. And I think there's a lot of pressure on them to be this perfect veterinarian and they learn in the ivory towers of school and then they get out to you know rocky mountain house where they're handed a bag full of euthanol and told to go to the chuck wagons and they're just like what what is this so it's um it's learning how to support them because they are they're blessed with more knowledge and more know-how than we are but they also the expectations are changing. Yeah. yeah. And I, I just want to speak Kat to our motivation of coming on here. Cause it was not easy. Right. I think we mm -hmm. opened up with that, you know, fear of negative consequences to our careers, speaking about this. Um, and that's our motivation is we're so passionate about large and mixed animal medicine. We don't want to be anywhere else. And we just want others, male and females, to also be able to enjoy that career. So, you know, speaking about this and, yeah, supporting them. And I think with, like, new technology and new drugs and better restraint, like, there is no reason that anyone, no matter what your stature or gender or, you know, ethnicity even is, can't do mixed animal with the right tools and the right mentorship. But that's what it comes down to is the right tools and the right mentorship. Right tools so. and right mentorship. Mm -hmm. Another and point, Eric, to, oh, go ahead, Natasha. I was just going to say, there's so many examples of that out there, right? We're talking about very specific um, minority events in our career, um, but there's mm -hmm. so many good examples out there that, yeah, people should find like where we currently are. My current job is just amazing. Yes. Yeah, it sure are. wonderful. I, before we go to next steps, I want to ask a question is, do you think that the struggles and challenges you have gone through have held back potential opportunities in your career? That's kind of a difficult question because I feel like some of my struggles have like built me into the vet that I am today mm. and made me more outspoken. It's made me more able to conquer those things that I know like vets in general are very type A, we're often very anti-conflict. And I know that that's kind of how I started my career. And then I realized like, if, who, if, if I don't speak for myself, who will, right? Like if I don't ask these hard questions, who will? Is it uncomfortable? Oh yeah, it's super uncomfortable, but it's still something that like, you know, I, I want this, so I've got to advocate for myself. Um, did it, you know, has it recently kind of pushed me away from being a full practice, like full mixed animal practice associate? 
where I wanted to stay? Yeah, I think, I think so. I mean, I, I had specific needs to stay in mixed practice and, you know, if those weren't being met, I had to move on and grow and change directions. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Very similar. Um, I think in, at the beginning of my career, I was quite naive um, to this. So I'm thankful that I did have the experiences to kind of um, help me mature and understand the world better. And it was a blessing um, most definitely for me. And I recognize because I had um, the courage and opportunity to change positions. Um, and because of that, I changed jobs and ended up to where I am today, which is pretty much my dream job and where I want to be. So excellent. Yeah. I think it also helps you realize like there's other stuff out there. Like yes. if you are, if you're unhappy and you know, you're feeling the toll on your mental health and there's things that you just are not really comfortable with in the station you're at, like there is other opportunities and there's so many other opportunities in veterinary medicine where you can still have impact on large animal or whatever you like doing just in a different direction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Mike, any points? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could see him chomping, getting ready to go there. I honestly don't even know where, where to go. Cause there's so much like, um, I guess I don't want to make a blanket statement and say like mixed animals hard, even though I, I would say my experience, like, yes, it is, it is hard. And I totally understand like feeling isolated. When you mentioned the chuck wagons, I like, I had a flashback. That was the scariest shift scary. of my it, life of I know. all of veterinary medicine like, like and I'm not a, like... <sighs> I know I'm not a horse vet and I remember being the on-call vet for the chuck wagons and I was like oh man like yeah. just survive this day but and anyway every time in Rocky they went around this corner you couldn't see and you're like oh no oh no oh no and then they'd all come out the other side and you're like one two three four and you're like oh all right. Like, I know. Yeah. So I was, I was there with you on that. I was just like, Oh, I can feel that in my stomach still. Um, <laughs> the thing that jumped out to me, it's kind of jumping back with the, the, the client versus the clinic. That was a bit shocking to me because I was kind of expecting more stories of maybe ignorant clients and hearing that, you know, you felt maybe more of it coming from the clinic uh, is disappointing. And, and to be honest, for me was shocking to hear that. So I almost want to jump back to that and just dive in a little bit deeper, like client versus clinic and where you're getting that from. So I think like, just like any job, like 10% of your clients probably suck. And um, there's 10% of your clients that made comments. Like I remember after a particularly hard calving outside and minus 15 on a schist of so mist in Rocky, as I was leaving, the people who had said nothing to me the whole time were like, can you send a man vet next time? And I said, there is 50, 50 at our clinic and we will send who is available. Or you could take no one and just got in my car and left and was like driving away. Like, well, I hope they don't shoot me. Um, but most clients, you go in with a good attitude. You go in with being very honest and you go in with, you know, a strong back and put in the work even if they don't like you at first, they see you a couple times and they're like, yeah, I mean, she, she does the work. Right. And they, they can't complain if everything is, you know, if you're preg checking at an adequate speed or you're semen testing and you're not afraid of getting behind any bull or your dairy herd healthing with a stool, but you still manage to get all the cows done. Like that doesn't really matter to them. It's the things like, you know, coming in and finding out that a bill at a horrible place to preg check that had no help and no assistance was discounted without even, even talking to you because the client complained. Those are, and, you know, saying, oh, no, they can't handle preg checking because they're a lady. Um, and that comes back to you in a roundabout way from the client. And then you're like, oh, my God, like. I'm not supported. And that hurts more because these are the people that are supposed to be your colleagues. These are the people that are supposed to be your scientific network of humans that has your back. And that's, that's what hurts. Yeah. You can, you can brush off a bad client. I mean, we all do it. We all have crappy clients that ruin our day and tell us we're in it for the money or we're not good enough or whatever. 
but it, it's, it's much more, I think, poignant when it's someone that you trusted and someone that you thought like, oh, you hired me and you thought I was a great addition. And I thought you had my back. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I, I think we're kind of fortunate in that way, Kat, that yeah. the times have been changing for a while. There were many, yeah. many women before us. Most of our clients have at least seen a female vet exactly. on their farm. So the first one. yeah, we didn't have yeah. to cross that river. But um, yeah. similar to your experience, um, the support from ownership or management makes all the difference. And I was just talking to a, another female coworker in my current position and a client asked her like, do you ever get pushback from male clients, you showing up as a female? Mm -hmm. And the truth is no, because the expectation is that the, the owners, the directors, the managers of the company trust us. They've hired us. They've trained us adequately. And therefore we are legit and yeah, just as good. And the clients understand that. So then yep. and if the clients it's straightforward. Come, that's up to the management too, to be yeah. like, you know, if the client comes in, it's like, this is a calving, I want you to call in one of the male vets. No. And, and the male vet gets on the phone and says, look, buddy, like all our females are hired by us. They're good. Yeah. You know, any vet here has been hired for a reason. You will get who you get. Yeah. yeah. You know, not pandering yeah. for that. Yeah. So I continue to struggle. And this is my head working right now. I'm going, am I off right now? Why does it matter? Oh, it doesn't. It, but it doesn't, it shouldn't, especially as an, again, watching words, especially as an employer, mm -hmm. but you can enable your clients to get their way by always yeah. asking for a man, by always asking for a certain person. And it even goes bigger than that, where it's not even just asking for a man. It's just asking for always the same senior vet and then when it comes to call or it comes to whatever and you get that client on the phone they're very belligerent and they're saying like no I always see doctor so and so and you're like doctor so and so is out of the country like I cannot help you you get me or you get no one yeah and you're set up for failure in that situation yeah. right the clients mm -hmm. yeah and I think that situation is changing with our veterinary shortage like I think clients are getting to realize like no, there's not always a vet. You take who you can get. You take, yeah. you get a vet, you're lucky in some places, right? Yeah, exactly. And you treat them with respect. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. agree. And I think that's one of the positives that is starting to show up with this veterinary shortage. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. And mm -hmm. we see that in the city and in our rural settings as well, for yeah. sure. Yeah. I'd love to change direction a little bit and ask about mentorship. Mm -hmm. What that's looked like for you over the years whether that has frankly looked different for you compared to some, perhaps your male colleagues and, or what has allowed you in your strength to make job changes and where that mentorship sits in your world right now. And that I think is going to look really different for the both of you now from a locum perspective versus Natasha with your role. Yeah. My, my three main mentors of all time are Dr. Randy Colleen, who was my first mentor as a freshman 18 year old. He used to be a bullfighter in the rodeo. He's a big man. And I remember him telling me, you will have to work a lot smarter than I had to do, but you will get to work smarter, not harder. And he's like, I worked harder. It didn't always work out. And he never doubted me, not for one second. Um, then I had Dr. Trisha Dowling, who also being a very powerful female role model, very big into mindfulness, big into, you know, supporting other veterinarians. And she taught me a lot about, you know, we have to make, we have to make ourselves better. She would always say the veterinary profession eats their young. And I didn't really understand that until now. And she's like, why aren't we changing this? Why aren't we taking steps to make it not like that? Instead of just saying, this is what was done to me. So I'm going to do it to you. And then Dr. Andy Acton, who I spent a summer with, um, he recently won a pretty significant bovine award. And uh, he would go out to a call with you. And while you were struggling with the prolapse, he'd chat up the farmer and he'd look over and say, try this. Oh, you're doing a great job, you know, and be like, no, she's a great student. This is awesome. Like this, this kid knows cows. And that's the kind of support you need. He would say like, okay, you're going to, he would, in front of clients, say you're going to see one, do one, teach one. And 
the client would bring in the next C-section and he'd be like, okay, well, it's your turn now. And just that kind of support and belief, but it's lifelong. I mean, I still phone up all three of these people to chat about cases and to pick their brains. And thank goodness I had them because when I was fairly isolated in Rocky, I still felt like I had my phone a friend available if I needed it. (laughs) <laughs> so I vowed to do the same. And I said, you know, to any new grads at our clinic, I said, here's my number, call me anytime, whether it's 2 a.m., whether it's 6 a.m. I don't ever want you to feel like I distinctly remember doing a prolapse out in Rocky and being like, I wish I was anywhere but here right now. Like, this is the worst. I don't know how to continue. I wish I was home. And I don't want people to feel like that. I think they should always have a lifeline so amazing yeah yeah Yeah. cat you you name dropped now i'm a little stressed that i might miss (laughs) someone on my mentor list but um i'm sure i've missed lots of people too those are just the big three yeah yeah and um (laughs) honestly i feel a little twinge in my heart because i recognize how fortunate i have been lucky Mm -hmm. privileged to have such good mentors and yeah i'm I'm eight years out of school and they're still (laughs) in my head all the time or i'm texting them and that will not change um, and yeah, a few that really jump out were um, all the employees at Border Vet Clinic. Uh, Mark Robitaille was one of my, my favorite. And I think he was um, really unique and showed me a few specifics, which um, especially getting back to gender in a, a large uh, male dominated industry, um, he believed that I could do anything he did. He continuously told me that, but he also recognized that there was differences because I was a woman. And this is kind of a funny story, but we were semen testing at a client out in the bald prairie and it came to take a lunch break. So all the men just go behind the pickup to relieve themselves. And I'm like, oh, I gotta go. <laughs> but, and before I said anything, he's like, oh, like let's go drive so you can have some privacy for you to go to the bathroom. And that was just like, wow, like he recognized that it was a little different. And that's just one story, but there's a long list of that. So I think that's important recognizing, you know, uniqueness. That's great. Yeah. yeah. I, I wanted to jump in. Um, I mean, all of these mentorship relationships sound amazing. How did you cultivate that? Like if we rewind all the way to the start and sort of pick one of them, it doesn't, doesn't matter which one, but how do you get to the point where eight years later, you can just pick up the phone and jump in? Like, how did that seedling sort of start? Like, is there any, anything that stands out to you? Cause I know when I think of mentorship, like it, it, it's a bit of a two-way street, right? Yeah. Where you're giving something or you're leaning in and then they recognize that and then they give back to you. And then, you know, fast forward eight years and you have this amazing relationship. So any sort of tips for maybe a really new grad listening or a student on how they can plant that seed of mentorship? Communication. Communication is really important. And showing appreciation. Like we're really bad at acknowledging each other for good things in veterinary medicine. We're extremely good at picking apart other vets for things they did poorly, um, which is becoming more and more apparent to me, which is disappointing. But, you know, if someone helps you out and you really appreciate it, you can say, hey, man, like, I really appreciated that. Thanks for showing it to me. And I know Becky Taylor always talks about, like, really meaning, putting meaning behind your words as well. So even that little text after a 2 a.m. calving that you came in from the, from the mentee saying, holy, thanks for being there. That's huge. And, um, you know, I... Well, my first mentor is different because um, we, there's three of us and we call ourselves his daughters because he didn't have any children. So um, that involved a lot of like, do you want to stay for dinner with me and my wife and me being like, yeah, okay. Um, And long, long hours and always just maintaining an upbeat attitude. But I think communication goes a long way. Sometimes I phone my mentors just to go over a cool case. Like maybe I don't need their assistance I just want to say like wow this happened today was really cool have you ever seen something like that before um Trish and I communicate a lot in photos I send her tons of photos of practice for her to use in lectures um and yeah it's just it's a two-way street so you can't expect someone to give you so much if you give them nothing in return like really a mentorship is a friendship and like any friendship it requires work yeah yeah I agree with that um and 
I am sensitive. I'm, I'm a strong believer in boundaries and we need to, you know, take care of our mental health. But for me, one of the biggest things that helped me succeed in my relationships was just showing up even when I was, you know, uncomfortable or didn't want to just showing that you were dedicated to the relationship and showing up. Availability is yeah. huge. Like if you say there's going to be someone to call and you don't answer your phone, that's, you know, or if you say mentorship is strong and you mentor them until they're a new grad and you've employed them. And then it's kind of like be free little bird. Um, that's, that's not mentorship either. Like mentorship is lifelong. It's a commitment and it can be a little tiring. It can be a little taxing, but it's still like, if you commit to it, you've got to be available. Got to go with it. Mm -hmm. What I'm hearing uh, from both of your stories is that also mentorship is not specific to be just case-based. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if that has evolved over time and it may have been more case-based at the start of your careers versus now. And I also bring this up because I speak with a lot of students and a lot of students say, what's your mentorship look like? What kind of mentorship program do you have? And I am based on Becky Taylor a lot and pushing mm -hmm. back and going, please define what mentorship looks like to yes. you because we may yeah, have I tell two every different single student feelings that comes through. on what it is. So I, I, yeah. I am curious because the aspects of mentorship could be very different and yet still both rewarding to the end to both of those partners in that relationship. Yeah, I think that's interesting because yeah, at the beginning of my career, it was, well, I don't know what to do with this case. I'm going to phone somebody. And especially with Trisha, like, and I mean, Trisha, Michael, I'm sure, you know, is like very involved in wellness and mental health. Like it became almost more of like a peer support and, you know, mental health check-ins, which is very different than I think a lot of students even know they need coming out. Um, I find I'm going to reference the Edmonton firefighters because yes. my spouse is an Edmonton firefighter, but they have something called a peer support network. And this is peers who have gone through their own struggles, whether mental health or unrelated, um, that they have listed that are in your hall or your district that you can phone if you are contemplating, say, seeing a psychologist or say, seeing like a counselor to just give you that little like push to go the right direction. And that has been huge for the firefighters because it's like, I can talk to John who I know and I've worked with and I know that he's a cool guy and he's going to tell me, yeah, it's okay to go to a counselor. And um, that's where I took the mental health um, uh, first aid in the fall. And I think that's huge for a clinic. Like I would encourage every clinic to have someone who's taken that because we all know the mental health strains and that part of the career. And that's still a little bit taboo to talk about as well. So yeah, it's more than just the work, but we know that it's more than just the work that stresses us out. So I appreciate you bringing up a uh, specific, and I'm jumped to you, Natasha, right away here, but I want to highlight a couple of comments in the pre-recording you made for the Edmonton firefighters. And the specific mm -hmm. comment that you had made is, these are big burly men that jump into fires and they are yet still willing to share and or advise or recommend to go seek mental health support. Yeah. Why can't we do that in the vet space? Yeah. Like it's just, it's mind boggling, boggling to me. It's a bunch of, you know, they, they're gym tan laundry type dudes and they're still like, Hey, you're taking care of your mental health. I'm like, why can't it be that easy? It should be that easy. I think it's conversations like this and there is a lot of advocates and like you said, powerful individuals out there that I think we're in that transition period. It's early, but I do feel that momentum starting to pick up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, Natasha, I cut you off there to jump in on the firefighters. I don't know if there's yeah. anything to add. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, solutions. We're coming towards the end here. Uh, mm -hmm. I would love to hear what the ideal looks like in both of your worlds for the struggles that you've had over the last eight years and where those struggles do not need to exist? I definitely think that you view each veterinarian coming into your practice as a colleague, regardless of what they look like, regardless of their gender. Um, and you 
you treat them like you would a colleague. We are a we're a brotherhood, right? Like you have to treat them with respect. It's not necessarily treating them as family because I don't like people that say we're a family because some people's families aren't even great. So they don't like that term, but um, it's respect. And it's respect in the terms of communication and being very open um, and allowing those difficult conversations to happen, allowing you to say, hey, you know, Ryan made a complaint about you being out there preg checking. Can we talk about this a little bit? Um, you know, was there anything that happened that was strange or difficult or whatever? Because um, he, he's, you know, yelling about wanting a discount. And it's instead of doing that all behind the scenes, it's like, these are your colleagues, you can talk to them, you can communicate to them, you know? Yeah, yeah, I agree, Kat. And like the beginning of our conversation, we, we talked about gender discrimination. We didn't say that mm -hmm. term, but that was what it is. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's important to know that um, discrimination or, or biases are not intentional, right? I understand no. that even in myself. So just hope um, that I always challenge myself and those I work with, like just to question, right? Be open to having the conversation. Like, oh, do I do have a bias here? And explore yeah. that I think so many problems lie there just not yeah, exploring that you know accepting and if you have like made a faux pas or a mistake mm -hmm. acknowledging that and using apologizing in a way that is not passing the buck that is an appropriate way to apologize will do more than anything else yeah so it, because you have to acknowledge the other person's feelings even if you don't necessarily agree yeah. Or yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Taking that few minutes of perhaps an uncomfortable situation and seeing mm -hmm. what great things can happen on the other side of it. If both individuals are coming from a place of respect. Yes. And, and there's a big humility. There. Yeah. yeah. And vulnerability, like beautiful mm -hmm. things can happen with what I've witnessed. Yeah. And I think it's, yeah. it's interesting that like, if you allow yourself the ability to see the other side and like, accept that you might not change their feelings but at least they can acknowledge yours that's it's an interesting space to be in like I've been with Becky Taylor's communication help trying to like push my boundaries on uncomfortable conversations and apologies in different ways and it's amazing that like what you said and interpreted and felt and what they said and interpreted and felt can be two like vastly different things but you also, you have to respect both sides. So, and I, you know, I think that um, just the acceptance that there's going to be more of us in veterinary medicine. So if you want employees, you better uh, figure out a way to do that. Um, it's what it so. is. Yep. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, yeah. anything to add on that at point? You can see him smiling oh, over there. No, I'm good. I'm just taking it all in. Mm -hmm. yeah. More conversations to have. I, um, before we go to the next steps, really appreciate the both of you coming on, being so open, vulnerable, and hopefully uh, being great examples for an individual or individuals that are listening to this podcast and going, wait a second, I've experienced the same. No one has shared this. I may take X next step to either help myself share in an uncomfortable conversation that leads to change. That's where we all need to be. So uh, I very much helpful. respect and appreciate uh, this conversation in a big way. More to come. Let's go to the impact round, though. In the Veterinary Project podcast, we always share the impact round. So we're switching gears here. We yeah. do a little bit of fun. This fun mm -hmm. encompasses some short questions, which uh, are uh, the same for each of our guests. And our first question in the impact round is, are you a cat? or a dog person? <laughs> um, well, I have three cats, so I think we're probably cat people. Um, though I'm also a dog person, but I'm a bit of a dog racist uh, for Shelties only. <laughs> so I love Sheldon Sheepdogs. Every time one comes in the clinic, I have to run to it and like ogle over it. But- um, Mini Shelties or the big Shelties? Uh, the like the little the ones. Little guys. Like, this yep. is literally how most of Trisha Dowling and I's relationship bloomed. Was like, you're Irish, I'm Irish. You like Shelties, I like Shelties, and like, yeah, we're best friends. We're best friends now. Yeah. 
Um, and for myself, I, I feel a bit like a hypocrite when I was in uh, vet school, I was probably a bit obnoxious with my passion for large animal medicine. And I, I think I, I said out loud, I would never have a cat, um, but I've had multiple cats and they're my fur babies and I also have a dog and I cannot choose between them. Yeah. The political answer as our future ABVMA president right there. <laughs> Jonathan, you weren't supposed to bring that up in this interview. <laughs> uh, yes. uh, I cannot edit that. I don't know how. Oh, good. <laughs> True or false? I wanted to be a veterinarian since I was a kid. Ooh, that one's true for me. I uh, drew my entire family as horses when I was in kindergarten. My, my father brought this up when I got into vet school. Finding out I couldn't be a pony was very tragic, so I decided I would fix ponies. Uh, true for me I, I spent a long time though trying to fall in love with something else because my older <laughs> sister is a veterinarian and I did not want to be a copycat but I, I did anyways you went that way for the both of you how would your friends describe what you do for a living um <laughs> so I uh I don't talk with my like main group of friends here much about my job because they're mostly IT and HR and um, lawyers and engineers and they don't want to hear about poop at all. Um, though my uh, my brother, who is a surgeon, describes me as a non-sterile surgeon. So go figure. <laughs> go figure. <laughs> Natasha. And for me, um, I don't think any of them adequately could. I think it's, uh, they know I, I travel a lot. I'm on the road a lot. Uh, they probably throw in a little spice of, you know, Western lifestyle, Yellowstone romance, but um, that's pretty <laughs> far from the truth. But they, they know I'm, I'm in rural areas with farmers. Yep. And fair to that point, Natasha, we've known each other for two years and I'm still trying to figure out what you do day to day. <laughs> yep. Fair. <laughs> This is great. <laughs> what is your favorite hobby? Well, my favorite hobby is probably riding horses, which is funny to say because I don't currently have a horse, which is I have had a horse basically my entire life. And uh, just the opportunity came along to sell my horse. So I did. And uh, now I'm focusing on, well, running. I do like running so and art. I'm, I have lots of hobbies. <laughs> nice. um, any of my hobbies are probably related to the farm my husband and I have. So um, I really like to spend time with my horses or in my flower beds doing yard work. Cool. And what in the world are you most grateful for? I think I'm most grateful for the unending support of my significant other. Um, he's a huge influence and positive influence on helping me get through difficult times and on the other people who are part of my network who constantly cheer me on and tell me that I'm doing great. Yeah. Darn cat. My answer is exactly the same. Um, supportive people, um, my husband, my mentors and the people I get to work with every day. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, once again, we thank you very much for joining us on this podcast today. Again, both from the adage of sharing in an uncomfortable, but very true conversation. Thank you for that openness. Um, and for all of our listeners for sharing what you seek as uh, possible solutions and or the reality that needs to change in mixed large animal medicine uh, for all of us. Those unconscious biases, sometimes, you know, straight, uh, these these comments that come out and and again mike i think pointed out clearly what does it look like from both a client as well as clinic perspective this fits into the aspect of veterinary shortage especially mixed large animal for sure and what is that dialogue that needs to occur so that this comes to an end now so we can move forward together as colleagues uh as cat you know referred to we are colleagues all together let's make that happen whatever that needs to look like to the benefit of everybody involved women female, different ethnicities, et cetera. So very much appreciate your time. For those that uh, may want to reach out to you, how does someone get a hold of Dr. Kat Purick right now? 
Uh, so I, they can reach out by email, which yeah. is just um, kbp415 at gmail.com. Haven't changed it since that school. Oopsies. Um, or I'm on, uh, I'm on Instagram and my tag is littlest bet shop. Nice. And we will have these in the show notes as well too. Dr. Natasha. Yes. You need to follow Kat though. I love her feed. It's so entertaining and um, informative. Uh, probably Instagram is the best for me. Uh, Natoosh.bet. That's my Man. handle. How do you spell Natoosh? Oh, uh, N-A-T-O-O-S-H. It's uh, what my family calls me and stuff. Yeah. So. I was going to say that yeah. straight from your baba. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> Ukrainian heritage. Yeah. Before we go to final last words, Mike, anything in conclusion on your end? Just to thank you. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. I can imagine it's, um, you know, a little bit unnerving to, to be that vulnerable and you're not sure how various people will receive it. But as Jonathan has said, these are conversations that have to happen. So I really appreciate it. And thank you for that. Yes. The conversation always ends with our guests what message would you like to leave for the veterinary community? I just want other female practitioners feeling the same, other new grads feeling isolated to know you're not alone and that there's people out there who want to support you um, that are available and that we're all in this together. Agreed. Um, I, I'd like to remind everyone that I do really believe that the uniqueness and transferability of the knowledge and skills we all learn as veterinarians is something to be very, very proud of. But in order to enjoy it and um, be able to experience a fulfilled life with it, uh, you need to take care of yourself. And um, there's lots of resources out there, but just remember to take care of yourself because ultimately no one else will. Thank you for listening to the Veterinary Project Podcast. As a recap, on behalf of our hosts, the Veterinary Project Podcast will be releasing new episodes weekly. So be sure to tune in as we bring you more conversations aimed at helping you enjoy a life well lived. If you enjoyed what you heard on the show and you want to stay in the know, please like, love, and or subscribe to the podcast on the listening platform of your choosing, as we're available on all the usual suspects. If you know of others that may benefit from these conversations, we'd love it if you please share the show with them, as this will help us grow our community to reach more and more veterinary professionals. Speaking of which, if you are a veterinary professional and would like to get connected with more like-minded individuals who are joining us on this journey, please send an email to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com, and we'll invite you to be a part of our private Facebook group. General feedback, requests for information, or perhaps requests to be a guest on the show can also be sent to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com. Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light, thank you for listening to the show, and we'll catch you again next week for another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. Bye for now. Bye.